Worcester Cathedral stands high above the River Severn, with a magnificent view of the Malvern Hills beyond. For sportsmen, it provides one of the most memorable backdrops in the land to a county cricket ground, which lies close to the west. The earliest part of the building dates back to 1084 AD. Since then, it's been refashioned and transformed into the magnificent building that it is today. Wollstone rebuilt it in the 11th century in the Norman style, with its massive pillars and rounded arches. Later, the Victorians under Sir Gilbert Scott added elaborate features, roof paintings, ornate marble sculptures and stained glass. Inside, it's a treasure house of colour, artistic stonework, superb wood carving and English history and religion. Nowadays, too, it's still a hive of activity as local people, volunteers and paid workers alike mend and maintain it, just as their predecessors have done through many centuries. I still get a lift when I go into the cathedral, most especially from the crypt. I think there's a spirit that's breathed into the very stones. You do feel mortal in a place like this because you realise there are thousands of people that have gone before you and you realise that we are all mortal. Worcester Cathedral lost much of its precious silver during the Civil War. Today it is being replaced and mended by Bertie Webb, who was the vicar of Evesham for many years. There he studied the skills of the silversmith. When he left the parish, he was given his tools as a present. One of the former bishops of Worcester, St Dunstan, was a silversmith and is now the patron of silversmiths. And uh, I rather favour his remark, which said every priest should have a handicraft. And I'm uh, enjoying following the steps and the advice of the good saintly Bishop of Worcester from the 11th century. It's a conquest in a way. It's getting a disc of silver or a strip of silver or a sheet of silver and imposing my will on it according to some sort of design. I think that's partly it. Uh, and then accepting the constraints that are necessary by the material. It hardens as you work it, and if you're not careful, it will snap. The Bishop of Worcester turned up here one night and said, Bertie, can you do anything with my ring? And he'd been gardening in it and snapped it and, and, and cracked the stone in the ring. Well, with the help of a local friend, I managed to get a stone, re the ring and got it back in time for him to be wearing it when the Queen arrived. A verge is what the clergy naughtily call an holy poker. It's a ceremonial wand carried in front of a dignitary by a verger. And uh, I suppose it's a symbolic way of saying somebody important is on the way. Well, nice to see you. And you, sit down. Thank you. Um, the custos, in a conversation yes, with me, said that there might be a new mm -hmm. verge offered to the cathedral as a memorial oh, gift. Geez. There's Slightly an aspect of theatre about a cathedral because of the scale of the thing. Um, Items like verges have to be noticeable and yet not obtrusive, and that's the challenge. Well, there are three here, and uh, I think they would be feasible, but quite frankly, before. I think it's good for anybody to be faced with something greater than we are, even if it's a building, uh, because the cathedral expresses in stone and construction and artistry, uh, attempts to give expression to the greatness of God. And in the end, that's the, what really matters. That 
fluent and romantic English composer Sir Edward Elgar, has his memorial at the west end of Worcester Cathedral, where he used to stand and watch his work being rehearsed for the Three Choirs Festival. The present choir is proud of its connection with Elgar and often performs his music. But under its master and organist, Donald Hunt, it also explores the work of scores of other composers. Monica Craze has the philosophy that she'd rather wear out than rust out, so she keeps herself busy. One of her jobs is helping out at the tea room in the cathedral cloisters, baking scones and organising the rotor of volunteers who serve there. We've got over 100 members, and I would say all except about six are over 60, but it's something they like to do in older age, and I look upon them a bit as my parish. We're glad to raise the money for the cathedral, but at the same time, it's partly to give a welcome to the people who come to the cathedral. And so, laughingly, we say it is the cheapest cup in town, except for the infirmary, where you only go there if you have to be there. Thank you very much. Thank you. I think respect has gone out of this modern world, and within the cathedral, Everything is done with such respect, the dignity of the choir coming in, the dignity of a building, which fills you with a certain awe when you come into it. Monica has a special line in knitted piglets, which are sold in the tea room together with tea cozies, potpourri, and other gifts made by Nina Bailey and her team. That'll be them here, so I yeah, come on. Yeah. I'm quickly. the last, I suppose. Now, that's my offering for this week. Oh, isn't he gorgeous? Look, nice, girls. He's pretty yes. lovely. Yes. Just Thank you. Little child. I want a lot more of those, please. Oh, right, you are. <laughs> oh, I think he's lovely. Originally, so it was tea cozies only before the craft began, and we had somebody who was called the tea cozy queen. Americans are very fond of tea cozies, and if they're coming, sometimes they ask us and they'll buy up to six or ten tea cozies. I didn't think the Americans drank tea, but still, they like the tea cozies. Life would be very dull for me if there wasn't anything to eat. <laughs> 
Jonathan Charles is the chaplain at the King's School, which stands close to the south of Worcester Cathedral. Over the last year, the building has been undergoing renovations. Jonathan gets involved with the students at all levels, from coaching football to teaching religious studies to taking services in the cathedral. I like to feel that when I'm refereeing, uh, one is earning the respect of uh, the players. And in the end, I'm not so interested in seeing the result, but it, seeing the 22 people who've been involved in this, walking away, making friends, and looking forward to the next time. Nick! It's been an interesting time this year because the students have almost been absent for a period of a year whilst the work has been going on in the cathedral. And I have wondered whether they've missed it. I can't really see and on the one or two occasions when the school has had a special service there this year, there's always been a great rejoicing and a great positive feeling that we're back in the cathedral again. So I do think it affects them, yes. Jesus is the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Happy are those who are called to his supper. The cathedral crypt is a chapel of unity and we frequently go into the crypt for informal services where there can be silences and prayers and somehow the atmosphere speaks to young people as well as it does to older people. With thanksgiving. Body of Christ, keep you in eternity. Body of Christ, keep you In her 80th year, former Great Ormond Street sister Yvonne Cowell is a member of the Worcester Cathedral Embroidery Guild. She and her friends gather together each week in the ancient 12th century chapter house to work on embroidery projects. When I was worked as a sister at Great Ormond Street, um, it was very difficult to get clothes, of course. And uh, I used to get bits of odd bits of wool and my mother used to undo old jumpers and she used to send me the bits of wool and I knitted them up for jumpers for the children, all stripy, very fashionable. First of all, uh, you do what is called your sampler. Uh, you're given a piece of hessian and having been taught the five stitches, you're then um, encouraged to make a little pattern for yourself on the embroidery. <laughs> and I had a very simple needle to do first. And then they came to the conclusion that I was good enough to have something a bit more no. difficult. Well, and I don't remember how many I've done. Um, it's not going very well there because I had some thin wool and some rather thick canvas. Yes. And I'm going to get into trouble down here, look, where it's yes. very frail. Yes. That will come out in the Being stretching. Being stretching, I expect, yes. yes. Oh, it's very nice anyway. It is very annoying when people put dirty feet on needlers. And what is even more annoying, when you're at the que three choirs and you see people picking up their needlers and sitting on them and squatting them flat. Which is, a, I regret to say, is a thing that is done quite often. And how long does it take you? Six months almost to the day. Oh, good. Are you worn out? <laughs> yes. Indeed. I've got another one ready for action. No, thank you. Oh, pity. The chairwoman the of the guild is Maureen nicely. Butcher, who's helped organise and stitch many of their most ambitious projects, including the 170 kneelers for the nave. This cushion is from the choir, part of a set, 
and we like to have a design of oak leaves because of our connection with Charles II, who watched the Battle of Worcester from the top of the tower and escaped and hid in an oak tree. And on the 29th of May, the Guildhall Gateway is always decorated with oak leaves in Worcester. And this cushion is a, this kneeler, <laughs> is um, taken from a design of one of the tiles in the choir and shows fishes, which is of course a, a, an ancient Christian symbol. The first Christians arrived in Worcester in the 4th century AD and there's been a church on the site for 1300 years. The cathedral has drawn pilgrims from far and wide to the city for centuries. King John, who signed the Magna Carta, was one of them. In his will, he asked that his body be placed between the shrines of the two Worcester saints, Oswald and Wollstone, so that he might have a better chance of slipping past the gatekeepers into heaven. Henry VIII's elder brother, Prince Arthur, who's said to have died from measles at the age of 15, has his memorial in a chantry beside the high altar. Had he survived and become king instead of his much-married brother, the religious and political history of Britain might have been entirely different. Well, that's that. Oh, you've got them all in there. Back in 1926, at the age of nine, Derek Bolland joined the Worcester Cathedral Voluntary Choir, which was founded in 1874. It's rare for a cathedral to boast two teams of singers. The Voluntary Choir takes the place of the Cathedral Choir when it's on holiday or away. I think I mentioned that uh, Michael Dunn was coming tonight, didn't I? Yes, that's right. For yes. his, um, for his uh, audition. audition. That's right. So let's hope he gets through. Derek still sings in the choir today, 66 years on, and helps with the day-to-day -day running of it as organiser, recruiter of new choristers, and most important of all, dispenser of sweets after rehearsals to the choir boys. It's four o'clock on a March afternoon, and the latest eager recruit arrives to have his audition with the voluntary choir. The voice test is not all that important, not at that time. Mr. Johnson, that's the choir master, he wants to make sure if they've got a chance of getting in, can they actually pitch the voice when he plays it on the piano? That's the most important thing. And then, of course, everything else is taught them. And so I'm going to play three notes, and I'd still like you to try and sing the top one. Ah. Very good. That evening, Michael, now a full member of the voluntary choir, is joined by the other boys for their weekly rehearsal. In the voluntary choir, we've got 25 boys and 20 men and they are all very good indeed. And to a certain extent, we have a small waiting list of boys trying to get in. Praise that song. Vation. Do it. Better. From the dean at the top, right down to the little choristers. They're all friends. It's like one happy family. And everyone knows everyone else. And most of it is all on Christian name terms and lots of little boys they call me Mr. B. Say that's I think that's nice really to call Mr. B. Tom. Get, um, get quieter. Get quieter. Get softer. So when you get softer, see if you can get softer without going flat, which is what some of you are doing. And oh, I could never leave the cathedral. Not until I'm forced to leave through my voice giving out. And even then I'm certain that even when my voice gives out, I'm certain there are things at the cathedral I could do. I don't quite know why I started giving sweets and chocolate, except that it was rather an incentive. Because if a boy was asked to do a solo on a Sunday evening, when it was over, you say, oh, very good, very good indeed. 
and then I used to have some chocolates ready and give them a bar of chocolate as a, as a, a prize, a gift. That's how it all started. And then the disappointment on the face of those who, who could have sung the solo but wasn't chosen. So in the end, they all have them now. And of course, you probably know boys are boys and we have to make some mark on them to make sure that they don't come more than once. Because with 25 boys lining up, you, don't, you can't quite remember who you've given out to and who you haven't. The cathedral crypt dates back to 1084 and is a place of silence and arches. It's the largest Norman crypt in England and one of the only surviving parts of St Wollstone's architectural triumph. It's one of David Birtwistle's favourite places. The cathedral is a subject which I return to again and again uh, for inspiration. To work in the crypt uh, is for an artist, a particularly interesting problem because one is in effect trying to capture the atmosphere. I still see it as a dark and, and mysterious place. Like almost every other cathedral in the land, Worcester is undergoing dramatic surgery. Whether the need for it is caused by acid rain or just old age, the work still has to be done and the skills of the craftsmen who built it matched. Former Marine David Reeves is now a master carpenter on the team which is busily engaged all over the great building to ensure that it's still in good fettle in another thousand years. Well, the difference between uh, an old building of this great age is that you can learn a lot more from it. You learn a different thing every day. Eddie is our electrician, but he has taught himself locksmithing because we've had nobody else to do it. They're, they're, they're long gone. So he's took it on as a hobby, and, and unfortunately, he's got lumbered with it. Eddie? Yes? I wonder if you'd have a look at this for me, please. It's off the old garden gate. All right, it's old. A bit, uh, yes, I think it's quite an old lock, isn't it? Have we got the key? Yeah. All oh, right. It's been repaired before, but... I'll have to finish this one off. I'll leave it over here. OK. Well, the cathedral becomes part of you because you have to work with the, the materials you're working with and you, you get used to it. 
you don't realise sometimes that you're working in a cathedral. You're so concentrated on the job you're doing and uh, you just don't realise the cathedral's there. It becomes part of your work. It's a way of life almost. Oh, no, you don't have to look for work. Work finds you in a building of this size. You just can't imagine the amount of work that needs doing. It's so vast, the amount of work, it'll never stop. You look at the work of people who built the cathedral and you realise how clever they were with the limited resources and tools they'd got. They, they were craftsmen in their own right far superior sometimes than we are, even with all our technology. All the building work that goes on has to fit in around the daily services of worship. The dean takes a keen interest in the work's progress. It's a spiritual place in all its identity, but working here you seem to lose a little bit of that. One seems to wander away from the spiritual things, you're, you're so intent in what you're trying to do, you seem to forget that it's a cathedral at times. You're more interested in the work itself. I'll soon be finished, I should think. Good? Yes. Well, I'd better let you get on. From the bottom right up to the top, renovations go on. In a hurricane a few years back, one of the pinnacles fell through the roof of the cathedral and smashed onto the floor of the north transept 200 feet below. Like so much else of the building, the pinnacles are being strengthened and replaced. The turmoil of central Birmingham is just half an hour's drive away, but the Malvern Hills lie in stately peace looking from afar much as they did when the cathedral was built 900 years ago. Like all these mighty buildings, it's a good place to find space and time for reflection. Sir Edward Elgar hated not to be here and wrote from London to a friend in Worcester, if it's sunshiny, just go round to the west end of the cathedral, look over the valley towards Malvern and bless my beloved country for me. What he so much valued in the building and in its surroundings is still well worth cherishing today. <laughs>